Hello everyone, Verena here from Earth Building School. Just tuning in a little bit late. I was going to go live at 12 o'clock, but we've had a big weekend running an in-person workshop. So I've enjoyed a little bit of um, downtime this morning and just getting my bearings um, to put my other hat on um, and talk to you about line plastering over earthen surfaces. So, yeah, this is part of um, a series of live streams that I'm planning over the next few weeks. So planning to go live once a week on Monday at lunchtime here for me in Aotearoa, New Zealand. And if you're watching live, say hi. If you're watching the replay, drop me a little comment, say hi, and maybe let me know where you're tuning in from. I hope you will find these uh, live streams valuable and useful. And I'm always here to answer questions. I'm here to have discussions. I know that the um, topic that we're going to touch upon today is a little bit of a, a hot topic in the natural building world. So really inviting um, robust conversation, um, exchange of experiences, questions, and professional experience as well. So really not claiming that what I'm presenting is the, the truth. It is based on my 20 plus years of professional experience with earthen buildings and with lime plasters. And it was prompted actually by a recent post in our group um, about an, a line plaster over an earthen surface which failed. So really wanting to preface this whole conversation, this, this live stream by saying, um, I really want to respect uh, the work and um, the projects everyone um, is bringing to the group, um, especially when it comes to line plasters even professionals are not uh, immune to failures. So by no means do I want to make this look like a critique of the project that was shared, um, really respecting that person's um, project and learning experience. Um, we do learn from failures and I'm really also someone that has learned from my own failures. So I'll talk about it, that a little bit later on as well. But it is an important topic and I, I have found that there is a little bit of misconception and confusion around, you know, um, what should be done, what is good practice, if lime plastering over earth is even advisable. And I hope that with the live stream today, with the presentation, that I can supply a little bit of more clarity just share my professional experience and open the conversation around this. It, it is an important topic. So I've pro prepared um, a few photos, like PowerPoint presentation type thing. And I'm just going to make sure that that all works um, and that you still hear uh, my voice while I'm screen sharing because there was an issue. Uh, can you just let me know that everything is going good? Yes, so I've got Scotty out there um, sound checking. Okay, great. So I will start um, with the presentation and just go into uh, the full, the full um, big screen so that I then can take you through this. So as I said, um, I'm planning a few more live streams. So today we're doing talking about lime plasters over earthen surfaces, and that will open up more conversation about breathability, which we'll go into more next week, and then also maintenance of earthen buildings. So as I said, it is a big topic, and I'm just going to sort of lay the foundations today, and we definitely can talk about this in more detail. So just to orient you towards the things. Um, I'm talking about lime plasters today, so I can't really explain what lime plasters are, the whole, the whole chemistry of it. This is something for another day. I'm sort of assuming that you know what lime plasters are. 
And just to explain the fundamental differences between lime plasters and earthen plasters. So both earth and lime plasters are natural plasters. They use different binders. So in earthen plasters, you have earth, clay-rich subsoil as the binder. In lime plaster, you have lime putty, burnt limestone, which gets turned into lime putty as the binder. And they both are used in natural buildings in slightly different uh, situations for different uses. So just wanting to explain the difference between the two in a nutshell. So both earthen plasters and lime plasters are used in the interior of the building. They, they look and feel quite different. So um, the lime plaster has a chemical cure. It goes harder than earthen plaster. It also gets harder over time as it cures more. And the earthen plaster is a little bit softer. It has earth, earthy color, uh, tones often. Um, it's not water durable as such, so it's not recommended in places where you have uh, running water or a water splash. Lime plaster, on the other hand, gets used in exterior situations, so it, it is definitely used in, in places where you would get rain on the earth on the exterior surface. It can stand up to, to, to that well. In terms of the materials, um, they're quite different to work with. So the earthen plaster are skin friendly, easy and forgiving to use. The lime plasters, because of the chemical cure and because of um, the alkalinity of the materials are a little bit harsher. So you definitely need to be mindful when you use them. You need to wear protective equipment like gloves and uh, goggles in case you would get a splash in your face. Um, it dries out the skin um, and it requires more skill because you're working um, against the clock because there is a chemical as opposed to just drying like with your earthen plasters. So quite different materials even though they're both natural and the reason why I'm mentioning both is because Often they get used in combination with each other and that sometimes can cause problems. So sometimes people will um, apply earthen base coats and then lime plaster top coats over the top of it. And we'll go into this a little in, in, into more detail, but that's sometimes where problems can happen. Okay, so. Lay of the land, the two plasters, but we're focusing on our lime plasters. Why would we use lime plasters? So often they are used in exterior situations um, because they really improve durability and waterproofness of the structure. So we're really focusing on lime plasters over earthen buildings right now. Lime plasters are also used over other substrates. So the lime has a very uh, long history. It's actually in construction has even longer history um, than for example, pottery. So thousands of years of lime plaster experience and many um, very old uh, remnants of plasters actually still intact. So it is a very, very durable material when it's done well and it gets stronger over time. It's just, that's it's, its beauty. Um, it is water resistant. So there's a nuance there. I, I don't call it waterproof. It is water resistant. So when it's cured, um, it doesn't wash away in running water the way that clay would maybe erode. It is compatible with earthen substrate, so it is compatible to go over earthen walls, solid earth walls. Uh, this has been done for centuries, if not thousands of years. So we have good data of um, people having done this for a long time. A lot of um, experience doing this. Generally, you, you, you're applying plasters uh, to weatherproof and 
make the building more airtight so if there's little gaps like a, applying a, a, a plaster coat over everything sorts that it improves serviceability which means your surfaces will become tidier neater wipeable and so forth um, you can do beautiful things with lime plaster so the aesthetic reasons should not be underestimated for you know why we would choose lime plasters both on the exterior and the interior of the building um, personally in, in my professional practice i concentrate on lime plasters on the exterior of buildings uh, for water proofing weather resistant type reasons and then on the interior of the building we sometimes uh, carry out things like tadlock which are specialty lime plasters but we don't do lime plasters so much on in interiors of, of buildings and because the uh, material is so alkaline it is antiseptic so it is a, 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 a hygienic um, surface so often in, in the past it was used for example in stables and so forth and there was um, regular lime washing that was carried out so mentioning that lime is an old old building material and it has somewhat what been um, not forgotten but it, it it hasn't been used so much anymore for a, a period of time because there are some restri restraints when working with lime, so you can't work with it in certain weather conditions. It cures slower and so forth, like there's a bit of skill involved. So it, it got displaced by cement stucco, unfortunately, in many places. But it has undergone a revival and it is still undergoing a revival now. Um, this started when people started realizing that by applying uh, cement stacos, especially to historic buildings, uh, they were doing a lot of damage. So especially in combination with earthen buildings, cement stucco is very incompatible. It traps moisture and creates a lot of problems, even failures of entire buildings, historic buildings. So when people started um, understanding what was going on with the cement stucco, they really understood that they had to use um, the original materials, which often were earth and then lime. So in conservation, in the conservation sector, the, the mortars and plaster, uh, lime mortars and lime plasters have been really um, restudied and there's a lot of uh, mastery that goes into creating um, historic mixes and applying those um, materials with great skill. It's also a, a material which is used in hempcrete these days. So um, there's a lot of research going into that. And with that also comes um, plastering of interiors and exteriors, maybe not so much over hempcrete, sometimes over hempcrete, but also over straw bale, over lath and over earthen surfaces, obviously. And the Tadlakt is a specialty lime technique which is quite popular so this is something um, people want to learn um, something we cover in in workshops but it's it's not really what we're talking about as so much um, we're really focusing on um, mainly exterior earth and, uh, lime plasters over earth and surfaces so as i said um this whole discussion about lime plasters over earthen materials is a little bit of a hot topic. There's a lot of discussion in the natural building world about it, whether or not it should be done, if it, you know, why there have been failures, uh, if it's bad practice and so forth. And I think um, I'm, I'm saying this um, also like, from observing uh, conversations online, conversations I've, I've had with colleagues, but also um, actually conversations that we have had um, during the revision of the New Zealand Earth Building Standards, where we um, brought lime plasters into the standard as an external finish for um, Adobe and other solid earth buildings. But we had to be very careful because when we're um, suggesting something for 
inclusion into a building standard, um, which then gets used by anyone that has the standard that is built like uh, self builders, we had to make sure that um, it is clear how to do this properly. Line plastering is a trade. It, it is a skill that has to be practiced. And there definitely have been failures um, internationally when combining the two materials. So the failures, you'll see a photo soon, is it's basically delamination of the plaster. So there, yeah, very strong opinions about both, uh, both on both sides. And my my feeling is, you know, we have been doing this for um, hundreds, if not thousands of years. So, of course, um, I feel that, you know, lime plasters are totally compatible um, over earthen sub substrates. Um, they're vapor permeable. So this whole thing about breathe breathability, which we'll touch upon more next week. They're breathable. They're also a little bit flexible. So because it's a little bit of a softer material than cement stucco, similarly to clay, um, they move with the building a little bit more. So we, cement stucco, for example, is very rigid. It's, it's very hard. And for that reason, also doesn't really gel with the softer substrate below over earth. The, the lime is, is a little bit more flexible, a bit softer. Still harder than clay, but um, much more compatible. It also has a similar um, expansion coefficient. So it means that in when buildings um, undergo temperature differences, um, there's a micro movement of expansion and contraction, which happens with all building materials. Uh, and some building materials are just more compatible with each other. So, for example, the steel and cement in concrete are very compatible with each other because they have a similar expansion rate. And on the other hand, um, lime and earth have a similar expansion rate. So they, they move in a similar fashion when there's temperature fluctuations. The point um, that needs to be made here, and we'll go into this in more detail in a, in a moment, is that in order for the lime plaster to adhere to the earthen substrate, good surface preparation is really important because lime and earth, they don't bond chemically. They don't adhere to each other in a chemical way. There's no chemical reaction between the two materials. The lime plaster really only grips on mechanically. So we need to make sure that there's adequate mechanic grip, ad adequate um, roughness of the surf earthen surface for the lime plaster to hold on. And as I said, lime plastering is a trade. It requires some experience and skill. Um, this can definitely be picked up but it is something that comes with practice and it also maybe uh, is, a, is a case of getting some training, at least, you know, doing test patches um, and just making sure that um, the skill is up to scratch before a whole building is attempted because it, it really can fail. So just to show you what I mean, uh, you know, it has been done for hundreds of years here in Aotearoa, New Zealand, our historic buildings are not super old, but still, you know, this building, for example, is 150 years old and it was um, restored with a lime plaster. So you see it had some damage and we applied a lime plaster and that is performing well. So typically for us, um, our lime plasters are over um, full, adobe walls or over historic coal buildings that's the scenario here and internationally you'll find it line plasters in many applications so you have the traditional timber frame buildings in germany riegelbau where you have earthen infill and then line plaster over top you will find it in the cob cottages in many places in many different countries um, for example, Japan has an amazing um, tradition of lime plasters over earthen surfaces. And 
every place has got a real rich tradition and craftsmanship and skill that goes into it, different recipes and so forth. So we're really only scratching the surface and I'm just sharing our um, humble work <laughs> with this combination, but just wanting to show, point out some details, you know, of how this can be carried out successfully. So a couple of um, new builds that we were involved in, both these buildings are made out of mud bricks. So they are adobe block and then they're finished with lime plaster. The bottom one is a lime plaster that had um, red oxide mixed into the top cut. So there's more of a cloudy kind of finish um, carried out by a, a dear friend of ours, tradesperson. And the top one is our work. So we have um, lime plastered the exterior of this building. And this building has additionally been finished with a silicate paint. So silicate, water glass paint, not to be confused with silicone. Then another, the mo probably most uh, high profile building that we have carried out to date is a broad greenhouse. So it is a double story cob building museum um, managed by the Nelson City Council here. And it has uh, very thick cob walls and a really chunky sort of rough cast um, lime plaster finish. The historic uh, rough cast did extremely well. This building is about also about 150 years old or 160. And we have only just recently re replaced the entire, entire exterior lime plaster because over time there were patchy repairs and some of that has been repaired in the 1960s with shot crate. So concrete, which was not very good for the building. And also the entire building had been painted with acrylic paint at some point. So the city council wanted to get rid of that and restore the building to its original traditional lime plaster with a breathable finish. Okay, so just to orient you to what we're talking about uh, in terms of plastering, and I'm just going to um, get you to look at the top scenario here. So the, the gray thing is the substrate. In our case, that would be the earthen wall. So often it's not quite as rough as that. This could be a cob surface. If it's a little bit straighter, you know, if, if you're working with mud bricks, it would be a little bit straighter than that. But you have an, an kind of an uneven surface. Same thing if you were building with straw bales or something like that. And then you're applying your first coat, which evens everything out. It's like a base coat or body coat. And then over the top of that, you, you might have one or two more coats, um, which are your top coats. So just to clarify that, we have the substrate, we have base coats, and then we have top coats. And they can be, you know, one, they usually are two, three layers, um, sometimes four if, if the substrate is very rough. Um, sometimes you have repairs, sometimes you have wooden members, which have to be treated um, in a certain way to prevent cracking. But this is the, the, the plaster structures, substrate, base coat, top coats. And the situation here is we're talking about um, decisions uh, in materials in our base coats. So sometimes we have the situation where probably mostly actually to, to save money because Lime is something you have to, you know, buy in. It is an added cost, you know, as opposed to digging subsoil, making your own uh, base coats, earthen base coats. So when you're making a decision about whether or not to use earth or lime in this base coat, this is typically where the problems can arise because sometimes these base coats are made out of sandy, earthen plasters and then they're just finished with a, a thin coat of lime plaster for supposed uh, waterproofing and sometimes that fails. Um, you could also 
choose lime for this base coat but as i said that will bring up the cost and it it is more um work with the lime you could still get a failure of delamination if this isn't done properly so again you know like the lime only grips onto the earth in a mechanical manner it doesn't chemically bond if you're using an earth plaster over an earthen surface um, the two things sort of just stick together because they're the same material. So the bond usually is very good. But when you're going to material changes from earth to lime, that's when you have to be careful. So just to show you what I'm talking about, um, delamination, that's how it looks. So the bottom one is a test wall we have carried out in, at our place. So it's over mud brick. Um, it was actually... Uh, a recipe with cow manure in the lime it's a, a, a detail but it delaminated and same thing with this one here um which was it is a, a an lem so it's a light earth infill it's a timber frame structure filled with clay light clay mix and then fit uh, covered with a base coat of earthen render and finished with a lime top coat or two lime top coats you see there's a, a different one here and then a, a, a thinner one here the white the very top um again i'm not critiquing this building this building has gone through a, a cyclone so there are many reasons why this delaminated but i've put in both examples to just show you a couple of things so here both these buildings are totally exposed to the to the elements so there's no um roof overhang actually our wall is not a building it's a it's a, just a side of a shed but there is no roof overhang and the lime plaster at the top has just sort of been either brought up to this board or rolled into the in, into the timber at the top of the structure so you can imagine when it's raining um water runs over the timbers here at the top and it can find its way between the timber and the lime plaster and in behind the lime plaster and onto the earthen wall so you see this quite well in in the detail down here so when there's rain rain runs to this top edge here and it can penetrate behind somewhat penetrate behind the the lime plaster and as soon as we have situations like that so as soon as there's any ingression of water that can touch the earthen substrate um, the earthen substrate doesn't just wash away it will get damp and then when it gets damp it it swells a little bit because it's clay and then when it dries out it shrinks again and you have this wet dry cycling over a period of time and because of the substrate being clay, that just happens. It, it, it is inherent to the material that it swells and shrinks when it gets wet and dries out. And this micro movement of swelling and shrinking will eventually lead to delamination fr from the lime plaster. So even if this chunk, these chunks here wouldn't have fallen off, at some point you would get to the point where if you knock the plaster it sounds very hollow and you know that the, the plaster is sort of just sitting there it's not actually gri gripping on anymore and it's maybe you know sometimes it sits there for many years and it still protects the wall but it's not actually holding on and then something happens like a big wind or there's movement in the structure or someone knocks it and a big chunk falls off so same thing happened here you know it had a lot of rain it was a cyclone it had it was water blasted with rain it probably already had a little bit of wet dry cycling happening and delamination happening before it the chunk fell off there's also cracks so there, there would have been a lot of movement in this building in, in the heavy weather event but the main thing I, I would like you to notice is the detailing at the top here which is not very good, you know, it, it just doesn't protect um, the building from water ingression. Same thing around the windows, that needs to be detailed well, because that's typically where water could 
make its way in. So just drawing your attention to these two situations. And then in contrast, this is a building that is also done with light earth infill. So it's a timber frame structure with an earthen infill that is a, a mix of earth and wood chips. And we um, lime plastered the exterior of this building. So when we got ready for plastering, um, we needed to make a couple of decisions. We had to decide whether or not we would apply an earthen base cut or if we would apply several lime plaster cuts. And we actually decided to work with um, earth for a portion of it and then switch to lime. Um, because two things, we, we wanted to minimize the use of lime because of the embodied energy in lime. And also because um, it's just more, more pleasant to work with earth and also the logistics of, of uh, the project actually. So we were in, in summer and we still had drying time. So the earthen plaster made sense where we waited for the lime plasters until autumn. What we did is we applied a self-supporting mesh. So it's a rigid mesh to span over any timber. Um, and we made sure that the, the flashing details, so all the, the material changes um, were thought through well in terms of water runoff. So for example, if you look at the left image here at the top, there is a gable end that is clad with timber that's overhanging the finished lime plaster and there's a drip edge so water running over that timber frame is not penetrating between the timber and the lime plaster it's actually dripping off um, over the window here there's a top flashing with a drip edge so it's a metal flashing that will allow water to drop drip off and it protects the joint between the window and the earth same thing on the on the side here. So there's a cover board which covers the gap and creates um, more uh, protection for water ingression. So these are just a few details. Also, you know, if you look at the roof overhang here on the right, top right, there's a bit of a roof overhang. And then the next thing we did is we really made sure that the earthen plaster we applied was not super sandy because that's where you typically run into problems. If you apply an earthen plaster that is too sandy and then go over it with a lime plaster, you the, the sandy earthen plaster is not very strong. It is softer than what you're putting over it. And also if there's any moisture ingression whatsoever, it can let go. And it can really lead to delamination. So we made sure that what we applied actually is more like a cob mix. So we had a lot of straw in it. It was quite nice and sticky. We did um, tests with the space cut to make sure that we didn't have too many shrinkage cracks to you know, fine tune our recipe there. Really made sure that it was uh, adhering to the substrate to this light earth infill really well and also you know we had these uh, strips of mesh shears to bridge the timber and we made sure that it all stuck together really well and it was um, nicely textured before so ready to receive uh, the lime plaster later on so with this base coat we could shape the surface, we could really, you know, um, create a nice substrate, a nice chunky earthen substrate that then later on got lime plastered. And the important aspect of this is A, it wasn't too sandy and B, it was really well textured. And we made sure it was adhering and it was supported in places where it could there could be movement. So the mesh in this case is important. Um, some plasters will incorporate a, a full mesh. So they will attach 
a mesh so that everything is supported by a mesh. Um, personally, I don't think this is necessary. So I, I like to um, minimize the use of mesh. And also there is this whole conversation about um, what types of mesh. So we like using self-supporting mesh. So that, that means the, re the actual mesh is actually rigid. So it's not just Hessian stapled to um, the timber it's it can support itself and it's well fixed so that it can carry some load because you're attaching quite a bit of weight with um, the plaster we also don't like using ferrous mesh so no chicken mesh or similar things um, because just from our work with historic buildings we have seen corrosion in those kinds of mesh materials so for us our choice is um, this is actually a, a geotechnical roading mesh. It is also what is used in earth building for horizontal reinforcing. So it's a it's a triax x triax uh, geo mesh. So the triangle shape there gives it its name, and it's it's quite easy to use, and it it doesn't corrode. And then you see here again a, a close up um, of the earthen base coat was nice and clay um, and nicely textured it had fiber in it you see we were applying it by hand and really making sure that it was sticking on we painted um, the dry light earth walls with a bit of clay slurry to activate adhesion and then went on by hand with this base coat, really working it in and then smoothing it over by hand and texturing it with uh, like the tool. So the scribing tool, the scoring tool. And then let that dry. So you see the earthen substrate here is dry and it was nice and stable. And then it received two coats of lime plaster. So. This lime plaster was done on a workshop. Um, it was uh, our natural finishes and artistry workshop, which was a lot of fun. It was nice to work with a group of people. Some of them were already experienced in lime plasters and making sure that um, when you're lime plastering, that you're getting the lime plaster on uh, with enough pressure and also fast enough so that you can really make sure that you also score the base lime plaster. If you're working by yourself, you know, it might go off. So it, it, lime plaster, plastering is a little bit more stressful than earthen plastering. It's a skill. So that's why I'm suggesting you start small and, and build up the skill before unleashing onto an entire building. So you need to make sure that these working times work for you in order to get it on you know go around corners do whole panels in one go if you can so that you don't have work joints and also that you have enough time for the material still to be soft enough for the scoring and then when you look at the other the smaller building uh, photo you see the building finished we did quite a lot of art on it so we applied a lime top coat which was sponged and then in places uh, we did things like sgraffito, fresco painting, the art to the surface, which was fun. You don't need to do that, but um, with lime you have nice uh, creative uh, opportunities. So um, if you're keen to give it a go, I, I would really encourage you to do something small, even, you know, a, a little sample can be done really nicely but again you know we applied two nice you know substantial um, lime coats lime plaster coats because that's the other thing you need to make sure is that when you're lime plastering over earth that the lime plaster is actually thick enough so i would suggest you know a minimum of 20 millimeters over the coats you know when all coats added up some of the traditional historic lime plasters are thicker. So, for example, on, on Brook Green House, that uh, museum that I showed earlier on, the plaster was up to 40 millimeters. And the reason for that is um, you need to understand that 
even though lime plaster doesn't wash away in in the rain it is water durable it's not waterproof so when you have water continuously going onto your lime plaster it will let moisture through and that's why you have to provide a, a minimum thickness so that the chance of the moisture going all the way through to your earthen substrate is minimized because again um, if that happens so if moisture penetrates all the way through it will start activating the clay surface and that will start swelling and drying out and swelling and drying out and then eventually you might have that delamination happening behind your lime plaster so really making sure that that lime coat lime plaster coat is thick enough and then ideally so for our commercial um, lime plasters we additionally add a silicate paint so traditionally th this would have been a lime wash that was reapplied regularly so not leaving um, lime plasters unfinished for too long really making sure that you at least apply a lime wash in multiple coats or ideally a silicate paint if you can afford it um, lime lime surfaces traditionally were maintained on a regular basis every year you know lime washing this is not something that we typically do with our buildings anymore so that's why we can't really um, transfer what was traditionally done one-to-one -to, -one to what we're doing now and that's a reason why I am quite fond of the silicate paint because the silicate paint really cuts down water penetration through the lime plaster but it still retains full breathability and I, I'll talk more about this next week when we talk about breathability it's a wonderful product uh, silicate paint and it is still when you apply it, it it's very matte so it, it looks very natural and it is a natural building material it is it is used extensively in historic uh, restoration work and it is very compatible uh, with lime and over earthen surface like as a last coat in that whole sit, uh, scenario with earthen substrates lime plasters and then silicate paint as finish so just on the note of historic buildings one more time um, this was another project we were involved in so you see on the right um, after we, we uh, took off um, the existing sort of a, was a patch work of lime plaster lime wash and cement stucco sort of several different um, re, i guess repair works that had been done over the years on a building here it's a cob building so um, you see the layers and you see there's been a bit of cracking from earthquakes and just over the duration of the life of this building we have um, done structural repairs to this earthen building and then it received the lime plaster and a silicate paint coat finish the reason why I'm pu I put this in here is because I wanted to show the plaster pump so this is Scotty spray spraying lime plaster and it is it is a better way of applying lime plasters to earthen substrates because blowing or like applying uh, the lime plaster with some force really getting that on there into every little nook and cranny rather than just dragging it on with a, 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 um, a, a hand tool gives you better bond so obviously this is not a machine that everyone has there is um, hoppers with um, compressed air that you can buy for cheaper than this ma machine so really um encouraging you if you if you have a big um, line plaster job coming up you know you have a full building maybe look into hiring or even buying a machine that can spray line plaster rather than applying everything by hand 
it speeds you up in the application of the lime plaster and it gives you more working time. So, you know, you can imagine that if you're applying everything with a trowel and a hook by hand, you're slower and then you have to go back um, bit by bit and, and sort of make sure it's all textured and ready to receive the next coat. When you're applying uh, the plaster with a machine, so when it's uh, thrown on like this, you can do a whole panel and then work, you know, trial and shape and score and do all these things. So you have more working time. And there's more likelihood that the bond is actually done well. If you're applying by hand, you need to, you know, get your technique down and really make sure that you're applying enough pressure for the line plus to grab on to the, the mechanical um, support below it. Okay, so to sum this all up, um, the takeaways would be do not plaster over sandy earthen base coats. Um, they're not strong enough and they're probably the reason for most of the failures we see or well, people share and where things have gone wrong. Really make sure that whatever substrate you're going over, so be this a, a solid earth wall or a clay rich, um, straw rich earthen base coat, provide heaps of mechanical bond. So if you're going over a, a, a kind of a smooth earthen surface, like a rand earth wall or even a smooth a mud brick wall, you need to score. You need to really make sure that the substrate has got uh, enough texture, enough places for your uh, lime plaster to grab on. Make sure that the substrate is stable. So your solid earth walls usually are stable. You know, if there's any loose bits, any dust, you need to get all of that off. You you typically wash it off um, actually with the water that floats on top of your lime putty. So the center water, you can wash the building. Make sure that it is really nice and stable. And also in the in the situations where you have timber members that these uh, pieces of timber are um, bridged with mesh. So use the a mesh where necessary. Think about movement in the building. So some some buildings move in wind. They're not so um, appropriate for then being plastered. If there's too much movement, you will have cracks. And in the worst case, there might be delamination. So make sure it's nice and stable. There's net mesh if necessary or everywhere. If you suspect there might be movement, the mesh is really um, fixed properly and then think about those details to prevent water ingression so typically at the top of the wall around lintels around windows so your your flashing details need to be done well adequate roof overhangs and so forth when you're applying the lime plaster go in several coats make sure that the overall lime plaster is thick enough so that you can be sure that water doesn't go through too fast and if you can paint the lime plaster with silicate paint give the plaster enough time to carbonate so to cure over a couple of months and then apply the silicate paint or at least several coats of lime wash and one option that I'm just going to mention here because that's what have what we did in the historic building and what we see quickly is that if the top coat of the lime top coat is rough there's more surface area you're actually creating a situation where the whole plaster can dry out faster so it's a little bit counterintuitive because you might think if it's rough that it catches more water but it actually it actually slows down water movement over the facade and it also gives more opportunity for the lime plaster to dry out. So the rough cast um, is, is a nice finish if you like uh, the look of it. Not everyone likes the look of it, but it, it is something to consider. It's also the reason why it has been done uh, historically with great success. Okay, so I hope um, I just go back and... 
come on and say hi and have a look if there were um, some questions at all. So I hope this is useful. Again, if you're watching this as a replay, say hi. Um, let me know where you're calling in from. If you're leaving comments, it will bump um, this post, it, which is posted in my Facebook group. So the uh, Earth Building School, uh, School Facebook group will bump it again and others will see it. So it helps with reach. So give us a little bit of love through a comment. Share this if you want to. Um, and let me know if you have questions. I'm very happy to answer questions. So I just have a quick look if there is anything. And if not, <laughs> yes, you're very welcome. Hi. Yes. And, you know, I, I totally acknowledge it's it's a, a big topic. Lime plasters by themselves are, you know, a huge topic. So we, we're just sort of scratching the surface. But don't be scared of doing them. Just do them well and do a little bit of practice before you unleash onto a house is <laughs> probably a good advice. So still for me, after, you know, 20 plus years of working with the materials, like it still gets me on my toes. So I'm still a little bit nervous about it. Also reading a, a good book actually is uh, using natural finishes. Um, by Katie Wiseman, Adam and Katie Wiseman, and they have these plasterings, plaster stories in there. And even there, you know, people that were working with lime were still saying it, it still keeps us on our, our toes. It's a natural material and it's it's probably the, the place where things can go wrong the easiest. But that's not to say that it's not totally compatible and a beautiful thing to combine lime and earth. Good luck with it. Okay, all the best and I'll see you next week. Bye.